Hi everyone, so you just finished posting your answers to the animal, plant, or fungus game on the discussion. And so I'm going to give you the answers to these and we're going to talk a little bit about each one of these organisms. I'll give you some fun facts. Hopefully you enjoyed looking at all of these cool pictures. I'm guessing that most of you are pretty sure that you knew what an animal, plant, or fungus was until maybe you started looking through some of these pictures and started to maybe question yourself. So. The point of this exercise is to give you an idea of the variation of life and to emphasize that sometimes you just can't tell what an organism is by looking at it. You have to get down to the cellular level, which we'll talk about a little bit later on in the semester. So without further ado, let's get started. So first off, this is an animal, it is an uh, axis deer. They are actually native to India, Sri Lanka, and that part of the world, but they were brought over here um, to Texas for game for game hunting really but they got out they were kept in farms once they got out they started out competing white-tailed deer in Texas and in parts of Hawaii even where they have no natural predators so you can actually go to Texas get a non-game license and bag as many of these deer as you want because they would really like to get rid of them as they are out competing the native white-tailed deer Hopefully you saw this one and thought that it was a plant. This is a white orchid, um, very pretty flower. They represent innocence, purity, elegance, and all of those good things. Here we have a fungus. This is the fly agaric mushroom. It has been used throughout history as an insecticide, which is where it got its name from. It would take pieces of this mushroom and sprinkle them in milk, and it would actually be used to kill flies. So. Um, very useful mushroom. Uh, parts of Siberia, people would eat this as an intoxicant, um, but it is incredibly dangerous. Most people report that it does not have good effects at all, uh, and too much of it can be deadly. Um, you may have heard of the berserk warriors from the Vikings. The berserks were actually supposedly on these mushrooms, and that, would, that was what would induce these fits of rage that they would have. So the first three that you looked at were pretty easy, pretty straightforward, but the rest of these may have got your thinking caps on. They're not as easy to identify. This that you're looking at in number four is a plant it's called Indian pipe. Indian pipe has been harvested in the past and used as a nerve medication. Um, it is a parasitic plant, but it does not feed on other plants. It actually feeds on a fungus called mycorrhizae, which you also saw in this exercise and we'll talk about a little bit later. This is a coral called the yellow Fiji leather coral. Um, and coral are a unique animal. So this is actually an animal. They have a relationship with algae. So they are actually photosynthetic and chemosynthetic. The algae makes food for this coral, but its tentacles that it spreads out can also capture uh, nutrients from the water and use that as food. And we'll talk a little bit more about the relationship between the coral and the algae later. And it's it's pretty unique relationship and maybe you've heard of coral bleaching when these um, little algae are kicked out of the coral due to stress. Number six here is called the white egret flower and sometimes it's also called the fringed orchid. Um, it's native to Japan and I think you can see pretty easily where it gets its name. What is a plant? Here you see a walking stick insect. They're excellent with camouflage, as you can imagine, and the primary predator of this insect is a bat because they use echolocation. They are not tricked by the camouflage of this walking stick. They can still pick them up, and so that is the number one predator of this animal. So this is called the lion's mane jellyfish, and it is indeed an animal. It is incredibly large. The bell on this jellyfish can be seven feet in diameter, and the tentacles can be over 120 feet long. It does require medical attention if you get stung by one. Um, however, on the subject of jellyfish stings, most of you have probably heard if you get stung by a jellyfish that you should pee on the sting. That is a myth. That is not true. If you do get stung by a jellyfish, they have these little tentacles with cells in those tentacles that have like a little needle in those cells. So when they come in contact with tissue, they pierce that tissue and they inject venom. To get those cells off, the best thing to do is use sand when you're on the beach to try to get the cells off and then vinegar will deactivate those cells called nidocytes and so they can no longer sting. So if you ever do get stung by a jellyfish, sand and vinegar, those are your friends. So you may remember earlier I mentioned mycorrhizae. This is what it looks like. This is a fungus. 
And um, mycorrhizae is actually the largest organism in the world. Most of it grows underground. They get very, very long. And there are actually forests where the plants are completely connected by mycorrhizae fungus. So nutrients can be swapped between trees, very common with pine forests. Um, mycorrhizae has what we call a symbiotic relationship. It's mutual with the plants that they infect. They are able to give nutrients to the plant and they're also able to take nutrients from the plant in excess. So they, they have a give and take relationship that is beneficial to both. Here we have another type of soft coral. This grows in the Red Sea. I'm really not sure what kind it is, but this is a coral. So it is in fact an animal, even though it may look very floral and plant-like. Number 11, though you don't see any leaves coming from this plant, it is a plant. It's called the corpse lily or the stinking corpse lily, and it smells like rotting flesh. This flower can actually be three feet in diameter. And if you notice the, the coloration of this plant, it also kind of looks like meat. And the smell combined with the color attracts flies, which are the main pollinator for this plant. And it grows in very tropical regions. Number 12, we're looking right here. This is actually an insect. So it is an animal that is on this tree. Maybe some of you saw it, maybe some of you did it, but this is the front leg right here. Here is the other front leg. This is the head and the antenna. Here's the body and I just don't see, I think those are the two legs on this side and it looks very much like a leaf. So it is called the walking leaf and it's in the same order of, of organisms as the walking stick that we saw earlier. So some super good camouflage on this guy. Number 13, some of you may recognize these. These are called leafy sea dragons and they are animals. Um, they actually grow off the coast of Australia. They're highly protected now. Divers were taking too many of them and so the population became threatened and so they're highly protected in Australia. But if you can't see it, here's its head and here's its body and there's the tail. Um, seahorses attached to rocks and many of you probably already know that they are a unique animal because it is the males that give birth and not the females in this case. So pretty cool. So this flat thing that we're looking at here above the sea turtle's head, this is another type of coral, therefore it is an animal. Uh, this coral does not have its tentacles um, out and about right now. It's probably nighttime, they're sucked back in. Most corals are photosynthetic, so they need day, daylight, but uh, that's back and forth on, on your corals. There are many that stay out at night to gather food from the water as well. Number 15, this is a really cute one. This is called the Naked Man Orchid, and I don't think it needs any further explanation of why it is called that. I think you can pretty much tell. Um, interesting fact about this plant. Back a long time ago in the 1700s, there was this um, idea called the Doctrine of Signatures, where people thought that if an organism was shaped like a part of the body, that it could be used to treat that part of the body. And so this organism was actually used to treat virility, in males um, because of its appearance. So also though, it does have an edible root, can be ground into a powder, and people in England can use that as a substitute for coffee. Number 16, I don't have a lot of cool information about. It looks like a skull, but this is in fact a plant. And um, this is a seed pod off of a snapdragon. So this is where the seeds would have actually come out. Number 17, you're probably looking at this thinking that this is a bee. However, it is not. This is part of the flower, so this is a plant. This is called the bumblebee orchid, and they reproduce in a unique way. They use something called sexual deceit, and what happens is they trick the organism that looks like this into thinking this can be its mate. And so the bumblebee will fly down to the flower and try to mate with it, pick up the pollen, and then take it to another flower. So interesting that's actually very common with orchids number 18 here some of you probably already know is called a sea cucumber it is an animal and sea cucumbers are interesting because they're pretty much just a tube it goes all the way through them so they have a mouth they have an anus and that's pretty much the whole thing the unique part is that sometimes fish called pearlfish will seek out a sea cucumber as its home. And what it will do is it will swim in the anus of the sea cucumber and it will just live there and sometimes even invite its friends. 
Now, this is another symbiotic relationship where two organisms live together. And the sea cucumber really doesn't mind this intrusion by the pearlfish, although sometimes they will try to keep them out, but the pearlfish has an adaptation where it can get back in. Um, however, occasionally, this will make a parasitic relationship with the sea cucumber where the pearlfish will eat the gonads or the testicles of the sea cucumber. However, sea cucumbers don't mind because they can grow them back. Isn't nature fantastic? Number 19 here, this white thing, maybe you remember the plant that we looked at earlier, the Indian pot, and perhaps now you're thinking that this might be a plant, but it's not, it is a fungus. Okay, so the white coral mushroom, some of these are edible, although most people don't like them, they're really tough and leathery, but some people love them. I wouldn't recommend eating any mushroom if you are not absolutely sure of what you're looking at, because all mushrooms can, can have toxicity to them, and you do have to cook Number 20 here looks like a flower, but this is in fact a fungus, and it is called the pepper pot earth star. And so you might see this middle part here, and you see these little holes. This is where the spores come out, and the primary way that they reproduce is it will rain on these, these things, and the raindrops will cause pressure to just puff those spores out, kind of like a puff ball, if you've ever seen or played with those in your yard where you tap on them and the black cloud comes out of the mushroom. Very similar, but rain is mostly what is used to release those spores. 21, you probably recognize as a Venus flytrap, and some of you are like, okay, well, it eats flies, but it's green, so I don't know if it's an animal or a plant, but technically it is a plant. Now, the cool thing about Venus flytraps, if you don't know, is that they grow in Wilmington, North Carolina, and a 75-mile radius around Wilmington, and that's the only place that you find these in the entire world. They are bog plants, so they like to grow in swamps and very low nutrients. They get most of their nitrogen from the plants that they, or sorry, from the insects that they ingest. And so they, they prefer low, low nitrogen soils where they have little competition with other plants and they can take in nutrients from the bugs they eat. Number 22 might look like a rock, but it's not. This is called the stone cactus. And you'll notice that they have these little clear windows on the top and most of the time this plant gets buried in the desert sands where it lives but this window is still open for the sunlight to go through and this clear window really helps these thick leaves and you can see how big these leaves are there's only two um, and so having that clear window at the top lets the sunlight come in and get to the tissues of this thick leaf so that photosynthesis can can occur in this plant there are many different varieties of them. You see this split here. This is where the flower comes from. It has a very sweet smelling flower. It's very pretty. You can buy these at Lowe's. They're very cheap. Um, they're kind of hard to grow though. <laughs> um, but the leaves also come from, the new leaves will come from this split as well. And as those new leaves emerge, these will shrivel up and die. So this is called the hairy frogfish. It is an animal. These are not actual hairs. They're extensions of the scales on, on their bodies. And if you can't see it, there's the eye, there's the mouth, here's a fin, here's a fin. They have a modified dorsal fin on their back that they use as an angler like you saw in Pondy Nemo. So they have this little dangly thing that they can wave around and encourage fish to come check it out thinking they're going to get a meal. And once they get close enough, they can swoop in and catch that fish very easily when it's within one body length of, of them. So this is called a basket star and it is an animal. It's like a starfish. It's in the same family as the brutal stars if you know what those are. Um, notice it has so many branching tentacles but still only technically has five. One, two, three, four, and five. Um, this is a unique organism. It was recently discovered. They live in the first few hundred meters of the ocean, so not tremendously deep sea, but also not typically found in shallow waters either. They're pretty cool in the fact that they can live up to 35 years. That's, that's a long time for a starfish. And the last one, just for funsies, this is an uh, elephant topiary is what you call these when you have the plants that are cut in a certain way. So this one is of an elephant at a, at a botanical garden in Saigon. So I hope that you, oh, and it is a plant, obviously. So I hope that you enjoyed this exercise. Please tell me what you thought was really cool, what you liked, and I hope that you'll list more than one or two things. I want to hear everything you thought that was pretty cool about 
this little lecture. So maybe this was a fun little activity. Hopefully you enjoyed it. And I'm really looking forward to talking more with you about um, these different kinds of organisms and how you can tell an animal, a plant, and a fungus apart on a cellular level. So we'll look forward to seeing you again next time. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye.